questions that will go with it. We commit the rest of the program into your hands. We pray that you will take the first seat, guide us even unto the end. We give you glory for being God and God always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kindly take your seats. The Chairman of the University Council, members of the University Council, the Vice Chancellor, Senior Management, Distinguished Guest Speaker, Tobio Mamao, members of Convocation, Distinguished Invited Guests, Students, Learners, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good afternoon. Let me welcome you again to this afternoon's program. I welcome you specifically to the City Auditorium of the University of Health and Allied Sciences. For our first timers, I'm sure you have already experienced the serene atmosphere of UHAS, and you are most welcome. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, today's session will be chaired by the Chairman of the University Council, His Lordship Justice Victor Jones Maulong Doche. It is my singular honor, therefore, to present to you our Chairman for this afternoon's program. Chairman of Council, May you address your audience. Thank you. Thank you, Registrar, for mentioning my sending very correctly. Thank you so much. I think many people on the protocol list are not here, so I'll start with members of you House Council, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Lydia Zato, the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Harry Tabo, the Registrar, Ms. Ya Amankwa Opuni, our eminent lecturer for the seventh JEM Leadership Lectures, Professor Ernest Aite, Vice Chancellors of Sister Universities in Ghana, Executive Secretary, Vice Chancellors Ghana, Registrars of Universities in Ghana, Director General, Ghana Health Service, Executive Secretary, Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, representatives of professional bodies here present, members of Atamir's Memorial Heritage Advisory Council, Chiefs of Sokode Traditional Area, Chiefs of Kojubi Traditional Area, Professor Kofi Anidoho, immediate past chairman of UHAS Council, Professor Fred Newton Binka, founding vice chancellor, Chief Director and Directors of Ministries, Departments and Agencies, Members of Convocation, Junior Members of UHAS, our invited students from the senior high schools, ladies and gentlemen of the press, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Governing Council of the University of Health and Allied Sciences Man Management, the entire university community, and on my own behalf, I welcome you all to the seventh annual JEM Leadership Lecture Series to be delivered by our eminent speaker and an ardent scholar, Professor Ernest Aite, Secretary General of the African Research Universities Alliance and former Vice Chancellor, University of Ghana, Legon. Undoubtedly, this annual lecture series has become one of the foremost distinctive hallmarks of this university thereby projecting the university in the academic limelight. During this year's lecture, we seek to find strategies of achieving health SDGs in Africa. As chairman of the University Council, I would like to extend our sincerest gratitude to Professor Ernest Aite for making it possible to share his experiences and thoughts on the subject matter. I entreat the entire university community 
to join me to welcome all our distinguished invited guests from far and near who are here to support us today. I therefore accept to chair the seventh John Evans Atamil's Memorial Lecture Series. And uh, I crave your indulgence for your cooperation and assistance. Thank you. Shall we do the applause again, please? May I kindly invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Lydia Ziato, to introduce our distinguished guest speaker. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our chairman for the occasion, who doubles up as our chairman of council, kindly permit me to stand on existing protocol that you and my registrar established. But I want to acknowledge Caroline and Wilson for coming all the way from the US to be with us today. You are welcome. Can you give us a wave? <laughs> welcome. So, as already indicated, we are here today for the seventh time to listen to very distinguished personalities who have made a name for themselves in their chosen fields. But before I introduce our speaker, Chairman, if you would permit me to give a brief background to this lecture series for the sake of our students and those who are here for the first time. The lecture series is named after our former president, Professor John Atta. Fifi Mills, or John Fifi Atangos, whichever one you like, there's a Fifi in the name. He was our third president of the Fourth Republic, and he was president from 2009 to 2012. Before then, he was also vice president of our nation from 1997 to 2001. This distinguished statesman was born many years ago, 1944, and he passed in 2012. He hails from the central region, but he was born in Takwa. He attended Achimota School, the University of Ghana, the London School of Economics, and he had bachelor's, master's, and PhD. He was in academia for 25 good years. He started as a lecturer and ended up as an associate professor. 
at the University of Ghana. What made me very happy is that our late president was also a sportsman. And once upon a time, he played the national hockey team. Because of that, he contributed significantly over the years to the various sectors of sports and also supported Accra Heart of Oak Sporting Club. So he's a phobia. He was a distinguished scholar, such that many universities invited him as a visiting scholar. Among them were universities in the UK, Holland, universities in other parts of the world, including Canada. This lecture series was named after him because the University of Health and Allied Sciences saw our late president as a very, very astute academic. He was a distinguished statesman, a very, very, very reliable political leader, and under his tenure as president of this nation, this university was established. And for that reason, the council and management of this university deemed it fit to name our lecture series after him. So, it started way back in 2016, where the first Vice Chancellor, Professor Benka, introduced to us a distinguished speaker, Professor Samuel Sefadide. He gave the first lecture. Subsequently, my immediate um, predecessor also introduced five speakers. And these were Dr. Duvlo, Dr. Moeti, Dr. Molino, Dr. Samaba, and the immediate last speaker was Dr. Japon. So these speakers spoke on different topics. And today, we have the seventh speaker. One of the responsibilities of a vice chancellor is to identify the distinguished speaker. And my first nominee was a distinguished man we are going to hear from today. So today we have Professor Ernest Aite. He is here with us and we'll be hearing from him very, very soon. He schooled in the University of Ghana. He went to the University of Science and Technology. And he also went to the University of Dortmund in, in Germany. He continued to work even after his retirement from the University of Ghana as the first General Secretary of the African Research Universities Alliance, which is popularly known as the Arua. Um, it was made up of 16 universities, but I know that recently some other universities have been added. I'm sure maybe he will make a statement to that effect. Under his leadership as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana between 2010 and 2016, the University of Health and Allied Sciences was born. And the University of Ghana mentored this university from the beginning. And he was a member of the interim council that helped to appoint um, various directors, vice chancellor, etc., for the university. He was able to release some of the staff of the University of Ghana to come here and start this university and give some resources for us at the beginning. So our history has a place for our distinguished speaker today. Professor Aite has also been a senior fellow and director of the Africa Growth Initiative Brookings Institute, Washington, D.C., between 20, 2009 and 2010. 
and he was also the director of ISE, University of Ghana. Our speaker today has also traversed across the globe in many distinguished universities as either a research fellow or a visiting scholar or a guest speaker, name it. So he's gone, been to the US, he's been to other parts of Africa, the UK, among others. Apart from that, he has also chaired many boards, served on many boards, chaired many committees, and served on those committees also. A few of them are picked up when reading his bio, included Chairman, Governing Board of N UNU, World Institute for Development Economics Research in Helsinki. He has also chaired on boards in Kenya and other places. Most importantly for me is also his extensive extension services. He has done a lot in the area of academia. For academics, we want to publish, and so he's been helping in the area of editorial services and serves as a very, very strong member of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. However, this lecture will culminate into an honorary doctorate tomorrow. But this will not be the first time. This will be his fifth, if I'm right, honorary doctorate that will receive tomorrow. He's already received four, one very recent. He received an honorary doctorate from the University of Sussex, UK, one from Lord University, Sweden, Stelly Bosch University in South Africa, and tomorrow, you has to be the fifth university awarding him honorary doctorate. <laughs> so this goes to show how astute, how experienced, how distinguished our speaker is. In a minute, we'll be hearing from him and he'll be talking to us on the economics of achieving the health sustainable development goals in Africa. The brochure or the uh, handout you have been given gives a succinct abstract or summary of what you'll be talking about. He promises to talk to us on Africa's progress made so far regarding our SDGs, most especially SDG 3, which is health, or which relates to health. He will share his thoughts on health financing and also talk to us on where universities stand when it comes to research and innovation in terms of advancing health in the areas of the sustainable development goals. So my dear audience, I have the singular honor to introduce to you our distinguished academic, our distinguished scholar, our distinguished speaker, Professor Ernest Aite. Thank you very much.
His Lordship, the Chairman of Council, members of the University Council, Madam Vice-Chancellor, Pro Vice-Chancellor, Registrar, a former Chairman of Council, Deans, Heads of Department, WO, Senior Members and Junior Members of UHAS, Visiting Vice-Chancellors, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. I am exceptionally pleased for this opportunity to come to UHAS. The main reason for my excitement comes from the fact that it gives me a chance to associate myself uh, with the work. Let me see if I can maneuver this properly. Um, associate myself with the work done by uh, Professor J.A. E. Mills as president in putting this university together. Uh, Professor Mills, as we've all been told, was a law professor and then became president of this country. But he never forgot, as a statesman, a strong interest in the growth of the academy. So for him, you has being created was simply a matter of uh, how to advance his interests in the advancement, in, in the advancement of uh, uh, higher education in Ghana. He had this ambition of giving every region in the country a university. The two that we associate closely with him will be Yuhas Yenho and the UNE in Sunyanu. These were the two that the Sefa Dede Committee uh, worked closely on. Um, Yuhas was then assigned to University of Ghana to mentor. Uh, Professor Kufi Ayindu, who as uh, chair of the interim council, we came into this operation together. And I'm very, very happy to see how things have evolved. So the close relationship between Yuhas and University of Ghana was there right from the beginning. Uh, there were many of our lecturers and professors at the medical school at Legon, uh, Nelson, and I see some of them here, uh, who were strongly interested in running away to UHAS. UHAS offered uh, a brighter uh, opportunity. They were going to be pioneers and much more likely to have freedom, greater freedom to do the things that they wanted to do. Uh, running away from the oppressor at the University of Ghana. So it was a good uh, experience having to manage colleagues carefully to see who could go and who could not go and who could go on a part-time basis, etc. But I'm glad that at the end it all worked out for the common good. Today we are here as part of a, a very well-established university and uh, I do hope that uh, the memory of uh, Professor J.A. E. Mills I well, encourage young Ghanaians to think about how their own future will pan out. Will they be remembered after they are dead and gone for good things that benefited many other people? Or are they only remembered for becoming a rich man and women and so on? I'm not saying it's bad to be a rich man and a woman, but there's much more to life than being rich. So, I do hope that uh, the memory of Professor J.A. E. Mills will serve as a good incentive for you to, as you prepare a way for the future. In today's lecture, I want to focus on uh, a few things. Why did, why did I choose the economics of the health SDGs? When the Vice Chancellor invited me to come and speak, she wanted me to choose a theme that was very much aligned to the interests of uh, UHAS. As you know, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a nurse, I'm not a pharmacist, I'm not a biomedicine person, 
so I, I didn't know how best to give a talk that will catch the attention of a, a health audience. It occurred to me that I knew quite a bit about the SDGs, and uh, I knew quite a bit about economics also. So maybe if I put the two together, we could end up with something that would be of interest to both parties. That's how we arrived at this particular topic. So over here, I want to talk about how Africa has fared with the health SDGs, with a focus on SDG 3. And uh, of course, it's evident, and I will show that, that we are struggling. So why has Africa struggled to do that, to achieve any meaningful outcomes under the SDGs, health SDGs? What are the costs if we want to achieve the SDGs? And can African countries afford that? If we want to do it, what should be some of the things that we should be thinking about? Is there a role for universities like you has in this endeavor? And then I will conclude. So as I said, I've thanked the Vice Chancellor for inviting me. Uh, one of the things I used to really enjoy at the University of Ghana, uh, we, used to, we had the say, Agri Fraser Gadget Beck Memorial Lectures. And uh, each year, when we were going to have it, uh, colleagues would be arguing with me about uh, who would be the uh, most appropriate speaker. And they wanted to choose the speaker with me. And uh, I will refer to them to the statutes of the university and say, show me where it is written that before I choose the speaker, I have to consult you. You know, it is the one thing, and uh, luckily for me, my chairman of council was in full alignment. It is the one thing that I decided I would do on my own without consulting anybody. Because when the speaker comes and doesn't do well, who do you blame? The vice chancellor. If you are going to be blaming me for a bad speaker, why should I let you choose the person for me? And uh, the, the councillor agreed with me. So every year, I brought a speaker who either I knew personally or somebody would vouch for the person. I remember Professor Yino who here gave me one person. We were looking for a lady uh, in the humanities. And he, I didn't do much in the So he knew them. And I said, Prof, if this woman doesn't do well, <laughs> who are we going to blame? He said, oh, I'll take the response. No problem. So we did it. I believe the same thing holds here at UHAS. If you're not happy, blame the vice chancellor. <laughs> yeah. If you enjoy it, thank the vice chancellor. So here we are. Uh, she also talked about my interests with the African Research University Alliance, which is a network of now 17 universities, including UCC, which was admitted two days ago. So now we are 17 members. The idea is to support African universities to do more research and be more competitive globally in the research arena. So that's what we do, and that's what my mission has been for a number of years now. So the SDG3, I'll share my thoughts with you about uh, the potential strategies. Uh, why do we do that? Because SDG3 makes a bold commitment to attaining various health outcomes, including ending the epidemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and other communicable diseases by 2030. It also aims to achieve universal health coverage reduce maternal mortality, and provide access to safe and effective medicines and vaccines for all. So it's a very comprehensive uh, goal, but it's important that we accept that within the 17 SDGs, none of them stands on its own. Each of the 17 is linked to the others. So whether it's in education, in the area of poverty, and so on, they are all linked. So it's very difficult to attain the health SDGs while doing badly on the others. That's an important thing that we must keep in mind. So the attainment of SDG 3 cannot come easily uh, if we don't think about SDG 2, which is dealing with zero hunger, SDG 6, dealing with clean water, sanitation, 11, dealing with uh, reduced inequality, 
uh, 12, it's about res responsible consumption and production, and 13, climate action, and then 17, partnerships for goals. These are other SDG goals that will, by all means, impact the attainment of the health SDGs. Prior to the framing of these targets, Africa had one of the worst records in terms of health outcomes. Um, so the presumption had been that the SDGs were going to help us overcome this. As I will be showing you, even though we've made significant progress on many of them, the situation still remains unsatisfactory. That's an important point. So I'm going to rely on the indicators for the 13 targets. Under each of these goals, there are a number of targets. So for the SDG3, there are 13 targets. So let's see how Africa has performed in this area. For the first one, of reducing the maternal mortality ratio, it's clear that Africa has halved, almost halved the, 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 the numbers over the past two decades. And yet, they are the highest in the world. So you can see, you can see, well, I hope you can see clearly over there that uh, uh, for Africa is in the second, uh, um, second from left, uh, group of um, or, or the charts and uh, you can see clearly that the maternal mortality ratio basically measuring maternal deaths per 100,000 live births has dropped from 878 to 542 which is significant in any case significant but certainly still the worst in the world and, uh, and uh, that, that's so we are going in the right direction but too slowly that's the message that I get from. We are going in the right direction. We had expected by 2020, we will be at par with the rest of the world. But the pace at which we are going, we are not likely. But we see that the trend is also the same for all the other regions, other developing regions. They are also going down, but we are not going as fast enough. We look at the Ending preventable deaths of newborns and children under five years of age. Again, the same trend you see there. Under five mortality rate for both sexes uh, going down. So we are going in the right direction. Under normal circumstances, you see that this trend is uh, generally positive. Except that you are not going fast enough to meet the targets that you set yourself by 2030. When it goes to infant mortality, the same trend you will see there. Uh, we are getting better and better. We are reducing the um, fatalities associated with infants as quite significantly, but not fast enough. Of course, there are other regions of the world, uh, especially South Asia, uh, that are also struggling. Countries like Bangladesh and part of India uh, cause the uh, situation that you see for uh, South Asia. On the other hand, for Sub-Saharan Africa, most countries are in a very bad state. When we think about neonatal mortality, um, again, the, the situation is quite bad in Africa. It's a little worse, uh, or used to be a little worse in South Asia, but they have uh, improved their situation a lot better than the Africa has done. So we see that both Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, Central and South Asia are in a bad situation but they are moving faster than we are when it comes to neonatal mortality rates. The third target of the SDGs was to end the epidemics of AI, uh, uh, AIDS, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, and other neglected tropical diseases while combating hepatitis, water bodies, and so on. Uh, we look at this chart reflecting on what we know about HIV incidence. And the Sub-Saharan Africa stand up, stands out um, from the pack. Uh, we see how bad things have improved significantly uh, over the uh, uh, last decade, but it's still much, much worse than in the rest of the world. Malaria, as we all know, is a very, very endemic in this area. Uh, HIV remains quite uh, serious, in, especially in Southern Africa, 
and also parts of East Africa, even though significant uh, improvements have been made in, over, in those places. So this is the situation in malaria. Africa be, remains the, the, the world's uh, hottest place for the incidence of malaria. Again, this uh, target four seeks to reduce by one third premature mortality from non-communicable diseases. Uh, we've seen, as we in, in figure seven here, the probability of dying from any cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, or chronic respiratory disease uh, between 30 and 70. As you can tell, uh, there isn't much difference between the situation in Africa uh, and in other parts of the world, largely because of the changing lifestyles. Many people associate this with globalization. As a result of globalization, we are able to export lifestyles from one part of the world to the other in a manner that does not discriminate too much uh, in terms of uh, disease incidence. So, uh, in the past, we in Africa thought we were uh, more isolated from some of these uh, cardiovascular challenges. We didn't see obesity as a problem, but today uh, it is very, very much a problem. Uh, mental health is uh, growing every day in significance in Africa, and so how do we deal with that? Suicide. In the past, when Africans spoke about uh, uh, suicide, it was something that uh, um, happened only quite infrequently. We didn't see it as a, becoming a major health issue. Uh, today, the statistics shows that uh, uh, even though it may not be as bad as in some other parts of the uh, global north, uh, it is still a problem here. Uh, and it's something that we cannot ignore. One that has to draw some attention from the public health system in terms of how do you deal with it. Under the fifth target, we aim to strengthen the, the prevention of uh, treatment for substance abuse, uh, including narcotic drugs and the other harmful, uh, the harmful use of alcohol. These are things that we are interested in. Have we been able to make any progress though? Uh, the situation is not as bad as in other parts of the, some other parts of the world. But what is interesting from this chart is that the situation in Africa is not changing. It has not changed at all in the period that we are, we've been looking at and uh, the likelihood that it will change uh, without any serious attention uh, is extremely low. We wanted to have the number of global uh, deaths uh, and injuries from road traffic accidents. Uh, we see that uh, the likelihood of dying from that is quite high in Africa much higher than in other parts of the world. Uh, we saw some improvements, slight improvements over the years, uh, but there's still a long way to go before we can catch up with the rest of the world in this area. So clearly, the need for us to do something about the road accidents. In Target 7, we are looking at uh, ensuring universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services. Uh, we've seen improvements. Uh, Proportion of women of creative age who have their need for family planning satisfied with modern methods. Uh, we've seen improvements happen across the world, uh, also in Africa. It's our hope that this improvement will continue uh, and will continue at an even faster pace in order that uh, we may be able to achieve the target by 2030. So, adolescent birth rates. Uh, per thousand women. So, number of uh, adolescents having children. Uh, we see, uh, like again, in Sub Saharan Africa, the highest incidence uh, birth among adolescents. Uh, Africa has the lowest proportion of women of reproductive age who have their need for time plan satisfied with modern methods. And the adolescent birth rate in Africa is still the highest in the world. Uh, the, the likelihood that, that an adolescent in Africa will have a live birth is uh, much higher than in other parts of the world and requires some uh, uh, attention, whether from the education sector or from the health sector, but governments need to do something about that, largely because these young women or girls are the future of uh, 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 the population and the future of the society and therefore need to be assisted in whatever way possible uh, for uh, the future. In Target 8, we are looking at 
achieving the universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health care services, and access to safe and uh, uh, effective medicines and vaccines for all. Uh, what this chart shows clearly is that uh, uh, there is improvement taking place in Africa, we moved from 23 percent to uh, from 23 to 44. Uh, clearly, improvements taking place, but still a long way to go. Uh, we now reached where uh, many North Africa started from, um, also moving ahead. How do we speed up this process uh, of providing universal health coverage? How do we strengthen the health insurance system that we have in place in order that uh, households may see uh, a better access to health? Here we are looking at the proportion of the population with large household expenditures on their health. Um, the figures show that uh, Africa is again lagging behind all the others. Um, households are spending between 6 and 7.3 percent of their incomes on health. Uh, is it something that uh, they can afford? Is it something they can improve? Is this the only thing that they can? spend money on. We have other things that are contending for allocations within their budgets and so on. So how do we enhance that? Table 9 want to reduce the number of deaths and illnesses from hazardous chemicals and air. So basically all the climate things that are changing, the environmental pollution, to what extent are these becoming a menace? Uh, so we, we measure here good mortality rate attributed to household and ambient air pollution. Uh, per 100,000 people. Uh, as we can see, the situation in Africa is not as bad as in many other places. And indeed, uh, it's gone down as a, 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 in a course of time. Uh, we see the situation in Central and North Asia. Uh, we see the situation in the uh, Eastern and Southern Asia. Clearly, huge challenges that need to be confronted. Mortality rate attributed to unsafe water. It's interesting how Africa stands out in this park. Uh, the, the, the water situation is one that is there for many, many African communities. What can we do if we want to improve on uh, the attainment of the health SDGs? Clearly, water is one area that we have to pay attention to. And then, tobacco. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, we've seen significant improvements in the uh, tobacco use among people between 15 uh, or people from 15. You know, it's interesting in the sense that uh, uh, even for a casual observer, uh, smoking in Africa has gone down considerably, um, except in parts of uh, South Africa and other parts of Southern Africa and East Africa. In West Africa, smoking is uh, almost, uh, I would say, almost non-existent. Uh, there are still areas in which smoking takes place, especially among younger people. Uh, so how do we deal with that? So, we want to re support research and development of vaccines and medicines for both uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. So this chart basically shows the proportion of target population with access to measles containing vaccine. I have the second dose of it. As you can see, uh, the non-presence of Africa is quite uh, astonishing in the sense that uh, everybody is making a lot of effort in this area, uh, but in the case of Africa, uh, very little and very slow progress is being made. Uh, we saw with the uh, recent uh, pandemic, the corona, we've seen how slow the uptake of vaccines in Africa has been compared to other parts of the world. Um, is it a matter of research? Is it a matter of simply spending money? But what can we do to enhance the use of vaccines and other treatments in this particular area? How much are we spending on the achieving the uh, SDGs uh, for health? Uh, we see here that uh, the use of official development assistance is very, very significant. Uh, there's a lot taking place, as the chart shows. Um, there's a lot of investment going into health um, or medical research, basic health facilities in 
sub-Saharan Africa compared to other parts, but this is all coming from official development systems. So basically, most of the work that we do in our laboratories, at the universities, in other uh, health facilities and so on, is all funded largely by official development assistance. And that is clearly not a very stable source of uh, funding for uh, uh, doing significant work. It means that the work you do is being dictated by others with an interest. It means that uh, whether you do work on vaccines or not depends on whether somebody sitting at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is interested or not. It, it means that uh, the type of work that the CDC is interested in the U.S. is what is going to amplify into what type of thing that you... So, of course, it's something that we should be concerned about and to be thinking about how to change the situation. Target 12 seeks to substantially increase health financing and recruitment. Uh, as you can see, uh, once you take out the official development assistance, uh, the support for the health worker uh, goes down significantly. So the health worker density uh, is very small in Africa compared to, other, compared to let's say, Central Asia, uh, East Asia, and so on. Uh, what can we do to improve on the numbers of people that we are putting into uh, the health system. Target 13 seeks to strengthen the capacity of all countries, in particular developed care for early warning, risk reduction, and the management of national and global health risks. Um, we in Africa for a long time have not been or had access to a properly structured facility for uh, planning these things. Today, we have what we call the Africa CDC, based in uh, Addis Ababa, uh, which relies heavily on external funding for its activities. Um, is there any chance that African governments can support the work of the CDC? And can we think about creating our own national CDCs that will be taking care of the public health infrastructure investment, the availability of resources, and the political commitment that, requires, that is required to pursue these things? In what way do African governments show their commitment to ending disease or reducing disease significantly? Africa's situation with the health SDGs has seen important changes. Uh, as I showed you from all these charts, we've seen improvements. We are moving in the right direction, definitely, but not moving fast enough. Not much progress has been made in dealing with the non-communicable diseases, as they appear to have taken infectious diseases are the largest drain on productivity. One of the things I do is try to raise funds for different types of researchers uh, to be able to do their work uh, through the uh, uh, network. Uh, one of the things we encountered at the beginning was whether we, we needed to spend money on the health research. Uh, and the reason for that debate was that more than 75% of all the research expenditure in Africa goes to health. More than 75%. So all the others, engineering, uh, uh, the humanities, the social sciences, and so on, they take only 25%. But of the 75% going to health, about 85% is going to infectious diseases. About 85% is going to infectious diseases. Um, so, and that's not surprising because these are the areas that are likely to cause significant public health challenges. Uh, the health challenges that you can spread to the rest of the world. So, of course, WHO is interested in making sure that you don't carry any infectious disease when you travel. So, that, that's one of the reasons. And that is a fairly attractive area. And so, we debated for a long time whether we should support health research, because even if we didn't do it, there was a high likelihood that the WHO would do it. Until we hit on the fact that, you know, uh, the non-communicable diseases uh, are also equally uh, neglected or have been equally neglected. And so we needed to, that's why we set up a, a center of excellence for non-communicable diseases to focus on cardiovascular uh, issues and so on. Um, the one thing that I've come to learn, even though I'm not a doctor, is that the interface between infections and the 
non-communicable diseases has become extremely uh, or much stronger than it used to be uh, thought to be the case. Uh, so the likelihood of somebody, uh, a serious hypertensive patient, uh, suffering from uh, some infection that uh, compounds his or her problem is a lot more serious today than uh, would have been the case in the past. What it means is that uh, as researchers, it doesn't make much sense to distinguish between infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases. So today, I, I like to quote my friends from Glasgow who have taught me about multi-mobility. So, I'm sure all of you are wondering why this economy is talking about multi-mobility. Yeah, because they have learned it. I have learned it in order to make a case. I have learned it in order to make the argument that supporting infectious disease research as opposed to uh, uh, diabetes or cardiovascular challenges and so on is really not important supporting them to work together so that the people who do the research for the infectious diseases will be working together with those in the diabetes and the, uh, hypertension area, cancers and so on, uh, that's the way to go. And I do hope that uh, you has will also learn from this. We talk about the fact that very little has been done by African countries uh, to deal with the issue of uh, uh, mobilizing funds. You know, so we are happy to go to uh, the U.S. and uh, talk to NIH, uh, talk to anybody to raise funds to do research. We are happy to work with the uh, FCDO in the U.K. We are happy to work with the European Union and so on, looking for funds for health research. But we don't talk much about whether our countries, our governments, are interested in putting research uh, funds there for health. Uh, today, uh, you have Slagon, KNUSD, UCC, UDS. How many of them receive support for the research that they do? And that's an area that we need to be thinking about. The African Union uh, has a very lofty ideal of an uh, Africa health strategy 2016 to 2030. Uh, and all of these are designed to facilitate uh, combating the uh, various challenges that we face with respect to the health SDGs. But not much progress has been made. Uh, the governments do not spend money on them. Uh, and because the government do not spend money on them, the only things that attract funding remain those of interest to the, uh, funding, the, the funding agencies. There are several possible reasons for Africa's inability to make any headway here. Challenges with poverty and inequality, uh, they are very, very significant. Many poor people cannot afford to change their health-seeking behavior. The high disease burden uh, goes without saying, poor health governance, a poor health governance, a hunger and even humanitarian crisis, conflicts between states and armed groups. Uh, yesterday I was looking at the uh, situation in, in the Sudan, for example, and looking at the number of people crossing the border into Chad as a result of the conflict in Sudan, asking myself, so why do Africans like to punish themselves like this? Whenever you think that you've overcome these uh, uh, issues, uh, you can trust an African politician to wake up and say, no, there's too much peace here. Let's bring some crisis to change the situation. So, so that's the, 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 the situation we find ourselves in, where, where uh, today, after so many years of conflict and then peace, we've gone back to conflict in uh, Sudan. How do we change that? Of course, it creates health challenges for Chad. It creates health challenges for uh, other, other, other countries in the region, whether in Egypt, south of e part of Egypt, and so on. We've got to deal with it. And of course, the main problem is the poor healthcare system. In many places, there's a shortage of health workers, uh, there are poor health facilities, and inadequate medical supplies. In our own country, Ghana, we have tried very hard to reform the system. We have tried very hard to build on various uh, uh, in initiatives at the district level, at the sub-district level, at uh, the regional level. We have different types of facilities, and yet we always struggle with finding personnel for them and equipping them properly. Let me talk a little bit about health financing. 
Africa's contribution to health expenditure has been between 5 and 6 percent of GDP uh, over the past uh, two decades. Uh, so you can see what we spend and what others are also uh, spending. Clearly, we are only a little uh, behind uh, the Asians and so on, uh, behind the East Asians and then also the, the South Asians. Uh, but the rest of the world is spending far more uh, on uh, health than we are doing. Um, even though our presidents, our leaders have committed to spending 15% of all expenditure on health care. That's what we've committed to do, but we don't do it. As you see, we are doing about 5 to 6% of GDP. The Africa, your average African country is spending about $40 uh, on health between 2000 and 2004, and this doubled to $83 uh, in the subsequent uh, five years. Now, if you compare this to other places where the, the global average is about between $543 and $1,052 uh, dollars in that period. Uh, so we are way, way behind what the rest of the world is spending on health uh, by, by the state. Most African countries spend just about 2% of their GDP on domestic general health expenditure, just under about 2%. And apart from South Asia, which spent less than 1%, Africa is not doing particularly well with the domestic spending on healthcare. So it's countries like uh, Bangladesh uh, um, that are pulling behind Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. They, they clearly are also causing a lot of trouble for South Asia. But really, do we have any reason to be comparing ourselves to see uh, nations in very significant, uh, significantly challenged uh, situations. So it's something that we need to think about. How do we enhance our health expenditures? Out-of-pocket expenditure remains one of the huge drawbacks to Africa in the attainment of the health SDGs. Money that we have to pay up front when we go to any health facilities. Um, it is a problem. Out of pocket expenditure of current health expenditure is about 33%. And uh, as for many people, a huge a drawback on what they can do or not do. When it comes to health financing, African governments have not invested well enough in health systems to ensure that they function properly. Um, in most African countries, especially here in West Africa, every few years you hear about the reforms. You hear about changes, you hear about new systems being uh, tried without any evidence that it will work or not work. Uh, we do this sometimes for political reasons, and uh, the problem is that uh, we do spend money, and we do spend money on things that do not necessarily yield the results that we are looking for. This is made Midwest by the various socioeconomic challenges facing the continent, especially uh, poverty inequality uh, and food insecurity. So it's not easy in a, an environment as challenged as ours to do the right for them. Uh, it's not easy largely because there are many things competing uh, for attention in the preparation of the national budgets. There is a need for education and I'm sure many of us here will be torn between supporting health and education. There's a need for dealing for creating jobs, there's a need to make sure that the roads uh, uh, are in a good enough condition for everybody. How do you address these things? And our, our proposal has always been seeking a balance. There's a minimum level that you shouldn't go beyond for health, and a minimum you shouldn't go beyond for education, a minimum you shouldn't go beyond for other social protection. How do you do that? If you put away politics, it becomes a lot easier to do. Once other interests take center stage, then it becomes difficult to do that. African governments have not invested well enough in their systems um, to ensure that they function properly. Today, if you go to a place like Hollywood, uh, it's very, very difficult to understand how the emergency Units operate. 
when you go to the surgical block, when you go to the medical block, when you go to any other blocks there, even the, the, the uh, much touted uh, cardio center, it's extremely difficult to understand why we as a people tolerate these conditions. Um, and we tolerate them because we, we, have, we don't want to spend more money on them. Uh, so we live in a country where the rich can afford to seek health care anywhere in the world. Uh, even in Ghana, they can go to the best facilities and pay for it. Uh, and the rest of us who cannot afford it will simply have to make do with whatever is available, no matter how bad it is. No matter how bad it is. So the inequality in the society is reflected by access to health facilities. Uh, how do we deal with it? Are we happy to simply uh, accept it and say this is, this is how it should be? You know, um, there have been some estimates of what it would take to attain the 13 targets under the SDG3. Uh, it's a lot of work done by my colleagues Stenbeck and others uh, working with the WHO, um, looking at the number of uh, low-income countries and middle-income countries, uh, most of which are in, in Africa. Um, they have estimated that uh, it's possible to achieve the, the SDGs, the health SDGs especially, if we used various scenarios, one is with the progress scenario and the other one is a very ambitious scenario, which allows us to achieve the targets within, uh, by 2030. So what we give you here is the uh, figures for both the uh, uh, progress that's scaling up uh, significantly and then the ambitious, which is the more ambitious one. Um, and basically, uh, what, what this figure shows here, it looks crowded, but uh, uh, it, it tells us that if we are willing to invest several billions of dollars uh, into our system, uh, we should be able to achieve more optimistic outcomes. Um, I don't want you to spend too much time on this chart here, but it, the, the summary of it is that uh, with an additional $274 million dollar, billion dollars per year, uh, we can achieve the SDG tar three targets in the progress scenario. If we raise it to $371 billion, uh, we could do the same for the ambitious scenario where we could do the ambitious, the, the number of people that we uh, taken care of under the SDG3 will be much larger under the ambitious scenario. Uh, this equates to an additional $41 uh, dollars, uh, or $58 per person in the final years of scale up. Can governments increase the spending per capita by uh, $41 initially and then $58? It can be done. Uh, the, the, if you look at the tax structure of many institutions or, or uh, countries, and uh, look at how the allocations are made. Uh, if you are able to move money from one place to the other, uh, targeting essentially not simply the entire uh, health system, but uh, focusing on aspects of the health sector that are much more promising. Um, so you, you, can, you can decide whether you're going to improve on the conditions for health workers, you can decide on improving the uh, facilities for admitting patients, or you can improve all the research facilities and so on. Which ones are much more likely to give you the best outcomes within the next seven years? And uh, the, these figures show uh, where you can actually do that. And it's something that is recommended has been very well known to our Ministry of Health for a number of years and so on. Health systems will account for probably 75% of the costs with the health, work, uh, health workforce uh, and infrastructure um, will take. So there are figures, that's an important message here, there are figures that show the types of expenditure that we need to make and the areas that we need to focus on. Once we do that, once we do that, we will begin to see progress. In a place like Ghana, there's no doubt in my mind that focusing on facilities at the district level will be a very, very important part of the equation. So you do the regional level, you do the district level and try design it in such a manner that the link between the two, between the regional level and the district level, and access to the district facilities is enhanced. It means providing for transportation. It means providing the health workers some support. And that's how you are going to do it. So 
one, this is just simply one of the uh, um, recommendations that is made in this work by Sternberg and others for us to increase investments in health systems. But as I said, it's not simply increasing the investment, but targeting the areas where returns are much more likely than uh, would have been the case. This table simply shows the current health expenditure per capita uh, in the uh, top 25, for the top 25 countries in this region. Uh, what is interesting is the fact that uh, uh, Ghana is one of the few countries where the health expenditure per capita dropped between 2015 and 2019. For most African countries, we saw improvements. Uh, for Ghana and uh, a couple of other countries, we saw a drop in that period. Clearly, uh, we are not moving in this well, this one, we're not moving in the direction that we should be headed, and that's a, a problematic. This table also simply provides us with the domestic government health expenditure uh, as part of the total expenditures. Uh, clearly, also uh, problematic for many uh, countries. Uh, in Ghana, we are spending we are spending 8.56 percent total expenditures. And then this dropped to 6.53 percent. So we dropped as a share of the total expenditures and also as a share of the GDP. Let me end my talk by looking at what role universities can play uh, in making a change or making some dent on the challenge that we face here. I've always maintained that uh, we are not going to achieve the SDGs, all of the SDGs, without a change in the way we produce goods and services, a change in the way we manage our economies, and in a change, a way, a change in the way we live our lives. And the only way you can change these things is to adopt new ways, new knowledge uh, in the pursuit of this. And new knowledge only comes from research. So we are not going to improve our access to vaccines in Ghana or in any part of Africa without investing in the generation of new knowledge, in the, in the, uh, the de development of vaccines and the uh, uh, production of the vaccines. We have been privy to a lot of support from different parts of the world, um, but all of that support, or most of that support, is for areas that we ourselves did not think about initially, but only became conversant with them because somebody from somewhere came and said, I have a grant to do work in this area, are you interested? Most of the work that has been done in malaria, in tuberculosis, uh, and so on, has been engineered by researchers from other parts of the world. They've done work here with us, they've done clinical trials for a number of years, and um, depending on whatever results they got, they moved on. We ourselves have very seldom initiated what we find as relevant for our environment and therefore more appropriate to be researched into. We haven't done that. And even when we are doing research, we have not paid enough attention to the discovery science element, what we are doing. We haven't done that. And we've always had a very good excuse that uh, we have a a, a difficult environment to work in. So, what can we as universities do differently? We need to pay a lot more attention to the research environment. We know that uh, we have heavy teaching loads at our universities, we know that. Uh, but we've got to find a balance. We've got to find a balance between the teaching element, what we do, and then the research element. How do we combine the two? I leave it to every university to think about. It's surprising, 
But it shouldn't be too surprising, though, that of all the generation of uh, uh, knowledge or the research output, the whole world, um, until about three years ago, Africa was producing less than 1% of it. Today, we've moved from 1% to about 3%. Uh, we've moved from 1% to 3%. So we know, we know exactly what needs to be done in many different parts. But that movement from 1% to 3% has been 90% from South Africa. 90% of that is from South Africa. So what are countries like Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, what are we doing? What are we doing in order to find the answers to some of the critical health challenges that we have? We've got to invest, got to invest in the science of doing this, the, the research. In order to do that, it's important that universities begin to channel some of their own resources into the research. I create an, an, an environment in which academics will be curious, academics will be willing to work with their students, looking for new areas of opportunity, being able to go out and look for partners in an equitable manner that reflects on both rigor and relevance, so that what you are doing is not simply an, a, a, a reflection of the research interests of people from the global north, but also uh, important for change in Africa. So we need to think about how we can do that. Today, when I talk to colleagues in the UK about supporting research in Africa, we talk about equitable partnerships, which means that we co-create, which means that we determine together whether the focus of our work should be, should be on the diabetes or should be on the uh, um, other uh, cardiovascular challenges or move on to um, infectious diseases. It's a, it's a choice that we make based on what we see as the profound requirements of our uh, country. So research equity, when we talk to the FCDO, when we talk to UKRI, we talk to the European Union, about research equity. And I'm very happy to say that uh, slowly, people are coming around to it. Uh, now, whenever I hear people talk about going to do research in Africa, everybody's talking about partnerships with equity, uh, co-creation, and co-development. That's the way forward. And I do hope that colleagues here at uh, UHAS uh, will be interested in this uh, development. So using or focusing on uh, science and knowledge generation is important. Uh, African governments need to understand that if they don't invest in their universities, they are not going to go much further than they are. You know, many African governments think that having a university is simply a nice thing. It's nice to have universities. It's nice to have a, a new buildings that you can show to uh, tourists. That they, you know, we want them to understand that it's not simply nice. It is the future. It is the future because you are going to train young minds and avert the attention to the problems of the nation and together find solutions to those problems. So supporting universities is not simply a nice thing to do or you are doing a favor to Utak or Gawa or uh, whoever might be there. No, you are doing it. If you do it well, that is your future. If you don't do it well, yeah, you will come back in another 10 years, the, the problem will be there. But of course, as the universities receive the support, they themselves must also be thinking, how do we make ourselves more relevant? How do we ensure that people are not dissatisfied with what we do? How do we ensure that the work we do will have a, a bigger impact on the community? How do we train medical doctors who understand the, the, the health challenges of the poor? How do we ensure that our nurses are not aloof? How do we make sure that the laboratory technicians and so on, uh, medical technologies are in, aligned, fully aligned with the health requirements of the population? And they are thinking 
more scientifically. So it's not simply a matter of walking into a hospital and doing your work as usual, but that science, the science taught, is well applied. It's not simply by intuition, but there's a proper application of science. That is what we should be doing. So as we move forward, uh, I would like to see many more universities think about their contribution, not only in terms of publications, the publications are important, but the publications must reflect the needs of the people. The publications must show exactly how we are doing in the area of public environmental occupational health, uh, how we are doing infectious disease, how we are doing in all these different areas. These are areas that I've mentioned here where we've shown some improvements. Uh, we began contributing significantly to the literature in these areas. Can we do it for other areas? It's something that we need to. Because simply focusing on uh, infectious diseases will give, make us good scholars, but it will not give us the chance to make a change in our population. It means we must spend a lot more money on higher education. It means that some of the IGF generated by you has will have to go into research. If you generate a lot of IGF and uh, you don't use it for research, you can be sure that nobody else is going to support you to do the research that you need. So let me conclude by indicating first my optimism that Africa can indeed achieve the SDGs. If it makes the right choices, it is not too late. It is not at all too late to make those right choices. Uh, the issue of insufficient domestic financing for healthcare is important and needs to be addressed. Uh, in doing so, we have to think about the health infrastructure, how we use that to build a proper health system, make sure that the health system functions uh, and is well aligned to health, to education, to transportation, to agriculture, and other things is very, very important. And then African governments, donors, international the world, need to work together. There's no point in having a system where donors come in and do one thing in the Volta region, uh, do a different thing in the northern region, or in any other regions, without much coordination. In the end, it's a dissipation of resources, and it's, a, it's a dissipation of effort, and that cannot help us to achieve the SDGs. But if we work together, universities, health systems, national governments, the African Union, development partners, we will be able to make a big difference. Thank you very much. May I now invite the UHA squad to take us through the interlude. Uh, as they do so, if you have any questions that have come up during this talk, please prepare them so that when the question time comes, you'll be ready with your questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chinyo and the Yuha Squire. Um, and so we have now come to the interactive portion of our event and would like to open the floor to those of us who were beneficiaries of that very, very impactful uh, talk uh, filled with all sorts of statistics that we would need to arm ourselves with going forward. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and the mic will be brought to you on the floor. Thank you. Thank you, our august lecturer. This is not mine. This is not my question. Mine will come later. This is from Professor John Japon, our immediate past um, vice chancellor. He says, the GDP of Africa is very low. So 5% of a low GDP or even the 15% target will be low. Doesn't the solution lie with growing the GDP? Thank you. Does anyone have anything along the same lines pertaining to GDP or growing of our income? Thank you, Prof, for that wonderful lecture. Prof, my question is, in Africa, in Ghana, we have economic problems and we have health problems. Which one should we solve first? Should we grow our economy? to improve our health outcomes, or we should invest in our, in our health system to improve our economic outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for the inciting lecture. Um, very interesting that South Africa is driving about 90% of the investors' contribution to research in Africa. And this doesn't come to me as a surprise because the research in NRA is being administered by the Department of Higher Education and Training. Prof, I want to pick your thoughts on the establishment of a national research fund in Ghana that you tag strongly resisted when it was proposed as a replacement of a, a book and research allowance. One of our fears was the um, equity benefit administration if um, BRA is taken away so that it is replaced by a national research uh, fund. I want to pick your thoughts on um, the contribution of this national research fund. If it is, it is going to, in a way, contribute to um, our drive towards the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. I think uh, Professor Japon's question is uh, uh, very much uh, similar. Uh, you recall that I said none of the SDGs can operate in isolation. And uh, one of the most important uh, is to do with poverty. So it's very difficult to uh, single out health in a very poor environment. The health status of individuals is strongly influenced by their economic status. So you've got to deal with both. So the challenge is how to structure your economic growth in a manner that it spills over into the households of the poor. That's why many years ago, people like me and others used to write extensively about inclusive growth. You know, inclusive growth. A growth that comes from many different sources, a growth that impacts many different people. 
So it's a kind of growth that generates employment, growth that provides jobs to people, a growth that provides food security. So yes, by all means, pursue inclusive growth. And when you do pursue inclusive growth, be intentional about how you support health. You know, so as the gains from the inclusive growth appear, you should know how much of that is going to health infrastructure. You should know how much of that is going to go into the capacity building of the workforce and so on. So it might be properly planned. So it's not an either or issue. It's a matter of where are the sources of growth coming from. If your growth comes from simply public services, as we've had in many developing countries, including Ghana, you can be sure that it's not going to have that impact on employment and jobs. It's not going to have that. So you've got to think about where do I want my growth to come from? If you do it properly, health, education, roads, they will all benefit. If you don't do it properly, you will find that your growth is leading to roads that go from nowhere to nowhere. Right? So I would say, let us properly structure the economy, pursue inclusive growth with an eye and the social. There's something wrong with your microphone here. Uh, there was another question about the South African uh, experience with the National Research Foundation. Yes, uh, it's a, an experience that I know very well, and we've been advocating um, a similar for Ghana. Uh, in South Africa, the NRF provides support uh, for all graduate training. So people doing their masters and their PhDs all have some support from the NRF to write their thesis. There's a lot of competition among young faculty through what they call the early career researcher initiatives. Uh, there's a lot of support for postdocs and so on. Uh, and then they have all these researchers at the various uh, South African universities. It is a type of thing that uh, ideally every country should be clamoring for. We talk all the time about the need for a proper development of the research ecosystem. And in that research ecosystem, universities have a role to play and the link between the university and industry it's a very, very crucial one in that respect. We in Ghana have talked quite a bit about starting a, a research fund, starting a research fund. And I, I've learned recently that they, indeed the uh, National Research Funding Act was passed through, but I didn't know it had been passed. But I was following the earlier developments um, while the argument was being made for us to have such a centralized system of support, in my view, a number of different interest groups emerged, and those interest groups sought to hijack the funding arrangement being put in place. There were universities that had no research uh, agenda, and you wanted to control the funding. There were uh, civil servants that wanted to use it as a means of controlling universities. There were politicians who, this was their chance to show, to flex their muscles and, you know, so everybody wanted to be a part of uh, that system. So the essential discussions which I thought were the more relevant never really took place uh, as to whether it should be a competitive system, you know, whether individuals apply or whether universities are giving grants 
and then they allocate on their own terms to their various people. These were the essential things. And while the, uh, uh, the debates at that political level was raging, you saw a contest between Ministry of Education and then the Ministry of Environment, Science and Technology on the same matter. The Minister of Education believed that he should manage that. The Mesti believed that they should manage that. It took about three years of to and fro between cabinets, and the, the government couldn't decide. You know, I, I believe that now something has been crafted, but whatever it is, is so watered down that uh, it would not make any impact until uh, a proper discussion of how a national research fund should be structured. It is not simply a matter of giving money to individuals. No, it goes beyond that. It's about developing a proper ecosystem for research where the teaching that is done at universities is strongly linked to the research and also uh, associated with what industry needs and what the wider society will require. We, we haven't done that. We, we, we've seen the politics of it. While this was taking place, Utag then jumped in. Utag jumped in uh, because, of, because the government wanted to use it to replace the book and research uh, allowance. I can understand Utag's problem because Utag was not really interested in the research. Utag was interested in the money. So if that is the case, I can understand why you would want your allowance to be preserved. The book and research allowance has become a salary supplement. That's what we all know. Then negotiate for it, but don't stop the development of a proper national research fund. So I think all the stakeholders, UTAC, the university management, the government of Ghana, the CSIR, all the state need to sit down and say, look, what are we trying to achieve? Is it simply how to share money? For many of these people, it's about how to share money. But that shouldn't be the case. It's about how do we use our limited resources to do the most and the best research for this country? I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you very much. This is from one of our online participants, Prof. The person is saying that because we have a lot of youth or the young people in this audience, can you share your thoughts on the role of the youth in achieving the health SDGs? Thank you. The role of the youth in achieving the health SDGs. That's a fairly easy thing to talk about. Don't get sick. Eh? The youth should adopt lifestyles that will minimize uh, risk, uh, the, the, the risk of, what do you call it, falling victim to anything. So that's the one area in which, I mean, the likely, all things being equal, uh, older people are more likely to uh, suffer from disease than younger people, all things being equal. You know, as an economist, we always talk about all things being equal. We know that in real life, it's not always that uh, things are equal. But um, for what are the things that are likely to introduce risk to younger people? Uh, there are many of the lifestyle diseases that have uh, uh, changed the situation for older people are not yet. Um, in the, uh, available to younger people. But there are other risks. I, I spoke about mental health. Uh, it's an area that the young people are prone to um, find challenges. How do you deal with that? Alcohol abuse increasingly in many parts of our world uh, is becoming something that uh, younger and younger people are being exposed to. Uh, narcotics and so on. So there are lifestyle issues 
some of which may be due to also the social systems that we uh, run. Um, if you look at South Africa, uh, young people under 15 living in the shanties are very likely to be exposed to um, drugs, narcotic drugs. Young people are very, very likely to be exposed to them. Uh, they are likely to be exposed to alcohol. They are ex likely to be exposed to violent behavior. So, yes, there are many, many things that could easily uh, make our young people uh, prone to disease. How do you deal with that? I think the, the, the challenge for us is not simply to leave it to the young people, but as parents, uh, as uh, mentors, as teachers, it's our responsibility to introduce them to uh, the situation where they, they, they are fully informed about what the costs to them and to their families and to the society can be as a result of uh, behavior that is uh, more risky than it needs to be. So it's, it's a lot of what we go through and the, the kind of health challenges we face are often result of choices that we make. So let's make the right choices, and if we do, we will minimize the risk uh, in um, finding difficult situations coming to us. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Since he doesn't have the mic, I will go ahead with my... This is from Professor Fred Binker, our Foundation Vice Chancellor. He says, I should ask you why Ghana has failed to create a research fund to support research. The USA NIH has a yearly budget of 30 billion, and Ghana is still zero cities. Thank you. I think I answered the, uh, his question earlier. Yeah, uh, Fred, if you are still listening, the, the, the response is that uh, we haven't thought about a research ecosystem. We have only thought about how to share the money that we want to put up for research. Let us move from a discussion of how to, how to build a research ecosystem and we'll be able to solve the problem. All right, thank you very much, Prof. Um, I want to know if uh, the time for us to be having a national conversation on infrastructural development, uh, where setting and use of health infrastructure should not be a political decision. Uh, case in point, uh, we all know about the Bruhaha regarding the University of Ghana Medical Center, where it appears as though the use and all those things were politically saddled. And um, the issues uh, relating to citing regarding the Agenda 111. Um, bottom line is about the management of our resources. So if it's a time for us to have this national conversation on how our health infrastructure should be developed, who should be leading this? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's a very important question. How do we depoliticize uh, decision making with respect to the allocation of uh, resources for various things? I mean, you can't completely depoliticize it. I mean, you elect people to and giving them their job, so by all means, their politics will come in. But how do you minimize that, the influence of the politics? Or how do you ensure that there's a system that balances the politics? In our system here, uh, unfortunately, everything is politics. Everything in Ghana is politics. Where to cite a hospital, where to cite a, a police station, where to cite a, a university, it's all politics. Uh, how do you change that? I don't have, if I, if I had the answer, I would have made a lot of money from it, but, uh, you know, I don't have the answer. But I, I believe firmly that with time, 
the political influence will go down. Uh, with time, the demands of the people will be such that uh, politicians will have no choice but to listen. Uh, and so, um, it, has to, it has to go down. You can't afford to have a country where all major decisions are simply political. Uh, that's certainly not effective. Uh, it's extremely costly, and it slows down development. So we, as a people, uh, you know, you gave the example of uh, UGMC. Yes, uh, I don't want to talk about it because I was involved, but it's an example of how when individuals believe that their political preferences might be reflected in everything in this country, it's not going to work. Uh, I'm again happy that you mentioned UGMC because it shows you exactly what kind of vision Professor Mills had. Hmm? Professor Mills was the president when we initiated UGMC. He bought into the vision. He accepted it and supported it. I can tell you, if Professor Mills had not supported the UGMC idea, it would never have taken place. Okay, please, talking about abusing the drugs or the usage of drugs, something like cigarettes, maybe it's not produced in Ghana, but imported into Ghana. Why then shouldn't the government place a ban on the importation of such drugs to prevent the people from using them? And also, if it's because of some economical reasons, then I think they should be allowed to use them so that they die and then reduce the population of the country in order to increase their per capita income. Yeah. I, I, um, I can understand your frustration, you know. I can understand your frustration. There are, there are other ways. Hmm? There are other ways of uh, dealing with it. Uh, in the good old days, in the old days, uh, simply buying the use. We used taxes. We used taxes to do that. So whenever the budget was read, announced increase in taxes, and uh, you can be sure that uh, uh, beer, uh, Guinness, cigarettes were always going to be the uh, targets for many of these. So presumably, if you made it more and more expensive, uh, they wouldn't buy. Right? But I say, we will disincent. I will favor uh, uh, providing a Let's think about how we can disincentivize uh, uh, alcohol use and uh, drug use. Okay. Thank you very much for the lecture you gave us. My question is on the name Africa CDC. Um, as a people, as unique as we are Africans, can we not carve our own unique name rather than replicating what has already been done? And in relation to that, um, from where you serve now, can you and would you like to initiate a step to um, reach AU to change the name from what it is now to what be unique to us as a people? Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's one question from online. Um, it says that, what is the difference between African health requirements and health funding? And does health funding take alternative medicine practices and research into account? 
Anything else pertaining to identity, continental African identity issues? Yeah, ask your question, go ahead. Sir, please, I'd like to ask that if all the SDGs goals are fulfilled and come true, will there be another goal or that will be the end? Thank you very, very much. Let me, let me deal with this last question first. Um, you know, the formulation of these uh, global goals is simply an uh, acceptance that uh, we need to have targets that countries feel compelled to pursue. We started with the Millennium Development Goals. Um, as the new millennium approached, at that time, poverty was the most striking thing, most striking thing across the world. So especially in Africa, in parts of Latin America, in parts of Asia. So with the Millennium Development Goals, as we entered the new millennium, we gave ourselves 15 years in which to eradicate poverty and change the face of the world. Uh, we saw after the 15 years that uh, nothing had happened. But the most interesting thing that uh, I learned pursuing the Millennium Development Goals was that countries were forced for the first time to think in a very structured way about how to deal with poverty. Now, if Ghana was able to reduce by more than 50% the incidence of poverty, it didn't happen by chance. There was a, a large number of different initiatives put in place that led to the reduction of poverty from 52% to over, a case over 27%. Something happened. But we didn't get far enough. Having more than 27% of the population living in poverty was still important, very significant. And so we decided, okay, what set of new um, commitments could we make as a globe to ensure that countries, again, had a very structured approach to dealing with things? That's why they settled on the SDGs. It's not... Um, a unique set of goals, but it's something to guide governments as they prepare every year uh, a budget or as they prepare their national plans. There's nothing in the, among the 17 SDGs that is controversial. They, and they are all goals that any normal government in a developing world should be pursued anyway. So trying to um, reduce maternal mortality by several uh, hundred percent is uh, clearly a, a worthy thing to pursue. Uh, trying to improve on the environment, something very important and needs to be pursued. What the SDGs do is they provide the government with a justification for making particular allocations. So if the government wants to spend uh, a certain part of the budget to dealing with the district health infrastructure, the justification is provided. And it's, difficult, it's, it's able to do that without blinking an eye because it can always argue that we have an obligation to meet this. That's why we do. So if we are able to achieve all of these things, by 2030, I would say, let us find new goals. There will be other things. I'm sure in 2030, we'll be worried about the number of children who spend all their time on social media. So we can develop an SDG on how to reduce a social media presence in our lives. There will always be something. 
that uh, we, we need to address in a more structured way. The question here was, um, why Africa CDC? Why, why do we name our uh, uh, Centers for Disease Control the Africa CDC? Uh, it's, it's, a, I, it's a very legitimate question. Uh, I wish I had a very easy answer for it. Um, as far as I can tell, it's the, the CDC that we know in the US that initiated the process of uh, uh, decentralizing and building and in partnership with the African Union came up. So I'm sure if the Africans were to make the case, in fact, I hope Fred Binka is still on the line and uh, would like to contribute to this one. So if the Africans uh, would like to have a version of Africa CDC that has all the trappings of what the Africans want, I don't think anybody would seriously object to giving it a, a name, a name that is reflective of the African ambitions and so on, especially if African governments would put resources into it. So, so the way I understand that question was, uh, as we pursue the development of that uh, research ecosystem, will we broaden it to move from uh, the uh, formal medicine that we know to take of alternative medicine? Yes, I don't see why not. Uh, I don't see why not. I think it's proper that uh, whatever we do, uh, we are able to support it with good research. So even if we are um, going to pursue alternative medicine in a uh, more vigorous manner than we have done. It must be supported and anchored in proper research. I, I will fully support that. And I think the health system, health system research that we have uh, in Ghana, that's big provision for that. That's why we have the Mampo uh, facility and so on. Thank you, Prof, for a very nice presentation. Um, during your presentation, um, I saw that the per capita expenditure for health has dipped in the country. Uh, we have a health levy, which every year um, the, uh, the income is increasing. So I don't quite get it why um, we should have the decrease. Is it a policy or um, non failure to comply or compliance to our policies or is change in strategy in the spend, uh, the how we spend this uh, income? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there, uh, there can be several explanations. Um, yes, the source of the revenue is not changing because of the uh, funding arrangement put in place, the uh, uh, earmarked funding in the uh, taxes. So that is not changing. So the, the, the absolute amounts that you collect will be given. But how much of it is actually spent, that is the part that uh, needs proper uh, interrogation. But beyond that, the population is also rising. So per capita, basically, is a reflection of the total number of people that you divide the uh, uh, numerator by. So that's where the issue is. So your population is growing very rapidly. And uh, you need to take care of them. Maybe you, you, your, the rate of increase in the revenue generation is not as high are the changes in the population. But uh, more interesting is what happens that as everything that you collect gets spent on health. Prof, I'd like to raise a question that I've always raised whenever I get a chance. <laughs> Maybe it is not because we are not doing enough research. 
could it be that unlike all those we started with at Independence, we do our research in foreign languages and the distribution of that research, the outcome is also in foreign languages. You take all the other countries we started with, Korea, Japan, a bit ahead at the time, uh, they took a decision on a language policy that compelled preparation for research to be done with competence in their own languages. And the products of those research are also made available and therefore easily accessible to everybody in their own languages. We are all aware that our colleagues are doing a lot of research, but we have conversations among ourselves. And one conference leads to another conference, which leads to another conference to discuss the outcome of the last conference among ourselves. You just responded to a question about work in alternative traditional knowledge systems. You may recall that I raised a question in council when we started, that the institute that was proposed for this university in the area of traditional and alternative medicine should be one of our priorities. I don't know how far we've gone with that. At the time, we thought it was going to start. I even made contact with some of the best traditional practitioners that I know, because in our systems also, there are quacks. And I contacted people who may not have gone to any medical school of the kind that we have gone to, but who are highly specialized in areas that should be part of our health delivery system officially. Some of them agreed that they would help if they were invited. So far, I don't think we have invited them. Sometimes, maybe because we wouldn't know whether, whether to appoint them as professors or as research associates or whatever. But until we deal with those fundamental problems that other countries resolved so that the knowledge system that was there already is not brushed aside, we can get billions of monies and do research that clearly may be earth-shaking. It will shake every earth except ours. Are we going to get to the point where when we talk of health research, what we do here in our lecture halls and in the labs can easily link up with what our people have been doing all this time before we started our universities. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ayidohu. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, the issue of language is clearly very important. Um, as I always say, language should not be a barrier to science. Um, so if we can investigate good science in any language at all, I don't have a problem with that. So um, it would be a shame if we were to use language as a barrier to applying or pursuing applying good science. So by all means, 
uh, if we need to allocate resources or dedicate resources to the development of language in the pursuit of science, uh, I, I will have no difficulty with it. Um, it would be unfortunate if in the pursuit of the language we ignored the science. And that's where I do hope our scientists will be able to uh, help us, guide us on how to ensure that uh, science is science, regardless of the language used, uh, it, done in a manner that is uh, applicable to, to a much wider setting, uh, in a manner that allows us to get the best out of whatever investigations we are conducting. So yes, by all means, uh, we should look at language. By all means, we should look at how uh, the pursuit of uh, science can be more or less democratized. That, that's the expression that I find in use in many, especially in South Africa, the, the democratization of science. How do you ensure that as many people as possible are able to get access to good science? I'm sure you has, uh, is considering exactly what it needs to do in order to Behind you, behind you. I should point out that when we started this place, there was a very specific proposal I made which was taken up. It was the fact that every student who graduates from this school must have competence in at least one other Ghanaian language apart from his or her own. It was a proposal which was accepted, but the implementation became a problem. Uh, it may interest you to know that a survey was made and the students at the time, when they were asked if they were given a chance, which other Ghanaian language they would learn. Some people thought that because the school was in the Volta region, a lot of people would ask for Ebe. Some thought it would be Chi or Akan, broadly. But surprisingly, what we got at the time, the majority of the students wanted to learn Hausa because they knew that out there in the field, they will reach more people. And in any case, most of them know three already, some know every already. But how to implement that? So we train very competent medical practitioners who cannot communicate with their patients in the wards directly. This is a gap. It's a challenge we must deal with. Other people have dealt with it. Sure. Thank you. Madam Vice Chancellor, I hope you are listening. Hmm? And the Chairman of Council. <laughs> Th thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. My name is Wilson Maje. I look Ghanaian, but I'm from Zimbabwe. Uh, I share with you the optimism that uh, if Africa makes the right investments and the right strategies, we can make much progress. My question is, are, is centered around corruption. You know, as, as we all do, that uh, uh, corruption is a cancer that we are dealing with uh, in many African countries. Yet we are at a point where we cannot afford to have our economic packet leaking in any, in any form. So my question is, uh, how can we embrace inclusive development when you are starting from a position of corruption? Yeah, it's one question I've always struggled to deal with. Also, corruption is there, and corruption is costly. Uh, corruption makes many, many, many things inaccessible for most people. So I, I understand that. But I also know that 
you don't deal with corruption simply through legislation. You can't simply ban corruption and then the people, you know. Uh, as I've watched other societies with uh, presumably less corruption, it's occurred to me that they are less corrupt because the process has evolved over time. They have been quite corrupt themselves over the years and have built systems that have allowed them to deal with the corruption. So they didn't simply wake up one day and everything had disappeared. Uh, there are systems where corruption is shunned by most people and there's no incentive, there's not much incentive for you to be corrupt over simple things. So there's corruption there when the stakes are very, very high. Talking about millions of dollars for uh, big projects and so on, yes. But in a place like ours where we are corrupt over tiny things, hmm, uh, we, we, can be, we can use a corrupt means to obtain five cities. We can, we can use a corrupt means to obtain, well these days people have become more brazen. They tell you, hey, give me 700 cities because if I take you to court, you pay 7,000. You see? So give me 10%. You see? So people have become more brazen. And they are because they know that uh, the uh, sanction for being found out is very low. You know? Uh, the sanction. If, if, you, if you took somebody, if you are looking for admission for your child in a school, and somebody took money from you in order to give that child of yours a place. You pay it because you expect that the income that will flow from the child's completion of schooling will be much higher than the bribe you've paid. But you are, through that, closing the door to some other more deserving child anyway. You know, we don't think about those things. Once we begin to sensitize people about these things, once we begin to make people feel bad about the cost of their actions on, to other people, that's when things are going to change. When a policeman demands money from you and you refuse to pay, you refuse to pay and the other people around you support you for not paying and will join you in protesting, that to make a difference. But when the policeman is taking the money from you, and others are shouting, oh, you to hurry up and pay, and let's all go, then there's a problem. You, you understand me? So, so it's not going to be just the legislation, but sanctions of different types, socially, and then, of course, legally. You know, we have to build a system that makes it unattractive, that makes it unacceptable. When people demand, so, I, so um, but I will not say that let's wait for all of these things to happen before we deal with our system. Of course, we can deal with the system also. There are hospitals that you go to, and uh, unless you pay, your card is not going to be found anyway. So, so we've got to deal with all of these things. Um, but I don't want us to hide behind corruption, and so because there's corruption, there's no point in doing things. Let's let the fight against corruption evolve in a, in a very holistic manner. People don't want it, and they will support you against it, and they will not, uh, what do you call it, throw you under the bus because you are resisting corruption. Thank you, Prof. Um, my question is about uh, the economics of investing in the health sector. My understanding is that uh, health financing, especially in the area of research and development, would also be a function of uh, the health economy. And we, we know of uh, the big pharmaceutical companies, like you, you said in the uh, Global North, having special interest in certain kinds of researchers. Would we not be helping ourselves if, uh, in the long run, we can, we can take steps to protect a certain section of the African health market, because we have the population, uh, and at least there's a Chinese uh, evidence to, to refer to, protect our 
health economy for our African pharmaceutical companies whom we should support to grow so that when we are, it affects all of us, they would be more willing beyond the government to also lend their support to uh, the health industry and the research and development in terms of uh, health. That's, that's my question, sir. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a very important question uh, which requires proper uh, cost-benefit analysis of in order Basically, what you are saying is, let's protect the African pharma industry. That's what I understood. Let's protect that. Uh, you are asking for that in a system that has, over the past 30 years, resisted protection for any industry. So the question becomes, why single out the pharma industry for protection? Um, can you provide enough evidence that any benefits from such protection will accrue to the wider society. You know, it's a, is, is there enough evidence, for example, that uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies that have invested in Ghana will invest in research? Um, I remember when I was at Legon and we were building the new school of pharmacy we approached all the big uh, pharmaceutical companies, both local and foreign, that had representation in Ghana to help us. And um, not, one, not one was interested, you know. Um, I would have thought this is something that if it worked, would benefit them, would training pharmacists who would support their work in Ghana and make it less necessary for them to be undertaking things, the R&D work outside, which is more expensive, and yet they were not interested. So it is appealing to hear you make that, but it requires some investigation. What are we likely to save? Who benefits from that savings, and how will that benefit be channeled up? You can't make a determination without a proper study. Thank you, Prof. Uh, with that, we have come to the end of the question uh, and answer interactive session. Uh, thank you all for your submissions. Uh, this has been a very fruitful session of learning the way forward in our effort to fund healthcare and attain some sustainability. Uh, at this time, I'm going to call upon our chairman for the occasion, your lordship, you have the podium. Please welcome Justice Victor J. M. Doce. Thank you, our MC. Uh, I don't think I have much to say. I just want first to react to Professor Nidoho's comments on the language policy. I didn't come to meet any such policy in the university. None was brought to my attention five years ago when I assumed office as chairman of council. So I will find out from, luckily, our first registrar is also here today. Uh, so now I will find out where that policy is and I will try to uh, see if it's implementable. Thank you. I think I will be doing injustice to Professor Aite if I attempt to summarize or give any summary. For all I know is that the delivery has been fantastic, has supported it with, as an economist, he has brought graphs to show the levels at which Africa has performed in all the SDGs. So we say that in law, the matter speaks for itself, which is in Latin, res ipsa loquita. So if the matter speaks for itself, a layman like me 
cannot say much. I only want to say that from my experience, I thought the health sector is one of the most resourced ministries in terms of holding seminars for this or that project. And I'm surprised at the low figures at which Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, has performed in all the clear indicators. It does show that we need to double our efforts and our health professionals to also be up and doing. But one thing that struck me is the research. Because since I became chairman of council, I have been trying to read many of the papers submitted by senior lecturers to, for ASOPROF, ASOPROF to PROF. And in most of the instances, I see the research is not relevant to African conditions. Most of them are foreign, but they are written with such impeccable data and scientific submissions that they go and they pass. So, and the papers are reviewed by very respected professors out there. So, who am I at council level to sit on such things? So, I will urge that in future, many of the research proposals should be aimed at solving indigenous health problems because we have a lot of them around. And if the funding is from outside, then most likely they will determine the area of research. So our urge, like Professor Aite has said, the pharmaceutical companies, the health institutions, to lead some of these research institutions. We have Council for Scientific and Industrial Research after, soon after independence and other research institutions in all the universities. So I believe there must be collaboration within all these research institutions so that we can achieve the SDGs by 2020. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Your Lordship, for steering this event to such a successful ending. Uh, and on that note, let me acknowledge uh, some of the, most of the guests that are here with us by name, and then there are a few groups that are here represented uh, in entirety. Uh, with that, Professor Martins Ekor, who is representing the Vice Chancellor of UCC. He is the Provost of the College of Health and Allied Sciences. You're welcome. Thank you for gracing our occasion. We have Professor Kofi Anidoho, the former council chairman, as a matter of fact, our first council chair here at UHAS. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Professor Christopher Mensa, Pro Vice Chancellor, Ho Technical University is here with us. <laughs> Professor John Ousu Japong, former vice chancellor of this very university is online with us. <laughs> Professor Fred Newton Binka, our first vice chancellor, is also here with us online. We have Dr. Cynthia Sena Peglo, our former registrar and the current executive secretary of Vice Chancellors Ghana. <laughs> Mr. Hardy Imoro Adam, administrator, Vice Chancellors Ghana. Professor Wilson Maji, University of Missouri, and Professor Caroline Orban, University of Missouri, are also here with us. <laughs> Dr. Christopher Amejo, Registrar, Ho Teaching Hospital, sorry, Ho Teaching University, is here with us. Ho Technical University. I stand corrected. Mr. George Kweku Debris, Registrar, EPUC Ho is here with us. Mr. Norris Kafui Ekeha, 
Deputy Rector, Adonai University College, is also here with us. We also have many traditional leaders here with us. Uh, we have Togbe Amwaku Duto of Sokode Etwe traditional area. Togbe Jekpalade the fourth Adaklu Kojobi traditional area. Togbe Kojo De Sokode Lokwe traditional area. All elders and queen mothers present. Thank you for gracing our occasion. We have many people who also joined us online, and we thank you for your presence and your engagement. Also here, supporting Professor Ernest IET are members of his family. His first lady, Professor Ellen IET, is here with us. We have several IETs. I'm not sure, but I'm going to assume these are either his children or in-laws or members of extended family. Albert IET is here. Felicia Nadede IET. Mr. Emmanuel Oforiba, a management consultant, is also here with us. Professor Kwame Asamoa. UG Council member is here with us. We have Dr. Wisdom Atiwote, Ministry of Health, with us. Okay. Also represented here in full force is the UHAS Council. Okay. Of course, led by Chairman uh, Justice Victor Jones Maulom Duce who I have already acknowledged. We have Dr. Mark Ameho, Dr. Emmanuel Newman, Mr. Courage Meteku, Mr. Felix Ofori, Mr. Duncan Franklin Ajato, Mr. Roger Mascot Lutrot. We have Mrs. Lucy Ofori Aye. Also here, uh, several deans and directors of this August University here with us. We have several teachers and students from the following high schools with whom we co collaborate regularly on these lectures. Ola SHS, are you in the house? Mm -hmm. School of Hygiene, oh, are you in the house? EP University College, you has basic school and Sunrise Christian High School, all represented here. I hope I have not forgotten somebody, but know that we appreciate your presence uh, and we thank you for your full engagement. No one fell asleep, so we thank God for that. <laughs> yes. And with that, we have come to the end of this, and I would like to invite our own Dr. Husseini W. Alidu. Are you in the house, Dr. Alidu? <laughs> he is the head of the Department of Medical Laboratory Sciences, School of Allied Health Sciences, to say the closing prayer for us. Before Dr. Alidu blesses us, I want to acknowledge also all our friends, partners, convocation joining online. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of the University Choir. And the media as well. Thank you for your presence. We thank God for bringing us to a successful end of a program. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een, Ahdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem, Sirat Al-Lazina An'amta Alayhim, 
غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. We thank the Almighty God, the Lord of the worlds, the most beneficent, the most merciful. He is the master of the day of judgment. All of us here, only He, the Almighty God, do we claim to worship and worship. And when we have need and when we feel inadequate, only He do we ask for help and support. May He guide all of us onto the path of righteousness, the path of those who took the direction of righteousness from when Adam came into the world until when the last human being will leave the world. May he not lead our paths towards the path of the misguided, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, and the others who refuse to listen to scripture. May he make our beginning good and our end from this world a pleasant sojourn. Amen. Thank you for your patience. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements for you. Uh, we will, when we're done, we will come down and join you and everybody will come down and we'll take photographs with uh, VIPs on the days. After we exit from here, uh, all invited guests, along with members of convocation, uh, and our special guests on stage will meet in the council chamber and foyer area for refreshments. Uh, the students and other uh, guests present uh, will stay behind and you will be taken care of in our absence. They will make specific announcements as to how to handle you. So thank you everyone and we will join you for photographs. <laughs> 